Hello and welcome. If you're new here, thank you for stopping by and checking out the channel. If you're a returning viewer, great to have you back. Today we're going to be going over the White Rose from Trihackme. Very interesting box. It's labeled as easy, but it's a little challenging on searching for the exploits. At least finding information on how to exploit them. All in all, pretty good room. I enjoy doing it. So if you haven't yet, remember to subscribe and hit like on the video. And let's get started. Okay, so here I got the box up and just wanted to make a note here. Remember to make sure you write down these credentials somewhere. So that way when we come across a spot where we can put some in, we can trim out to see if they work. All right, as always, first thing we need to do is a quick scan to see if we can find any open ports. As you can see here, I'm using the dash F, so I'm only doing the top 100 ports. Dash PN, because we know the box is up. I'm popping in the IP address to see what we can find. All right, so we got back, we've got an SSH port and HTTP port, so pretty basic. Okay, so we get ready to do our second MMAP scan so we can try to find some more detailed information. We can just target just the ports we found so that way we don't have to waste our time. All righty, here we go back with some detailed information. Looks like we just got a standard SSH port, nothing stands out. Low version 7.6, a little outdated. On our HTTP port, we're running Nginx, good to know. We do get a title for the page, Cypress National Bank. Request resource was a login, so there's something there maybe. And it looks like it's running Ubuntu for the OS. So let's see if we can pull this up in our browser and see what we get. Alrighty, here we go. So I just entered HTTP in the IP address, and it changed its name to cypherspank.thm. So if you want to go into your ECT host file, add that IP address, and there's your name put in for it. Now as we can see here, we just get a blank page, and if we go to view source, nothing really stands out here. There's not too much going on. So let's go back in our terminal, and let's do a directory scan. Alrighty, here we go. We're just going to do a basic directory scan. We're using the big.txt word file, and we're going to be fuzzing after the cypressbank.thm. Let's see what we can find. Okay, so it looks like we didn't find anything. So there's a couple of different steps you could do after this. One that I like to do next is to do a subdomain scan. If you're not familiar with that, like where it says cypressbank.thm right here, if you would see something say like login.cypressbank or something before the website there, that's going to be a subdomain. Okay, and if you're not familiar with how to do it with Oof, this is how you would basically set up. You still have your word list, and they do have a word list that's more tailored for subdomains. I just tend to use this one for the basic stuff. We have our URL here. As you can see, it looks normal, but our fuzz keyword is going to be in this, dash H. We're going to pass host, fuzz.cypherspank.thm. So let's run it and see if we can find anything. Alrighty, so this is a good example of trial and error to find things. As you can see here, we are getting status 200 back on all of these. If you notice, all these are words one. So let's filter that out. And we'll simply do that by tacking on a dash FW1 at the end for filter word count. Let's try that again. Alrighty, so here we go. Looks like we found four things. Now, when using a file like this, in this case, any alterations of capitals and lowercase letters you see like that, just take it as one web page. We got a status 302 on that. It's interesting. And then we get a triple W with a status 200. So in your ECT host file, go in and you'll add two more lines, one with the admin.cypherspank.thm and one with the triple w.cypherspank.thm. So while you do that, I'm going to get the next uh, directory scan in, and we'll take a look at that admin and see if we can enumerate any more files on it. All righty, here we go. All I did was, in our URL, just append that admin on the front with a dot, and then in our dash h, went ahead and did admin there as well, just to make sure everything gets through. Let's run this and see if we find anything interesting. Alrighty, so it looks like we found several things here, and if you look, we've got a login with a status 200. So my guess is that when we load this into the browser, admin.cypherspank is going to redirect us to the slash login page. Also makes sense because you see we got search, messages, and settings, all with a 302. That's a redirect code. So until we get authenticated, it's just going to bounce us back to the login. So let's go take a look at that. And sure enough, there we go. We're at the slash login. Now, sorry for the way this looks. I'm using the uh, super dark mode filter here. I'm just kind of getting tired of all the white backgrounds everywhere. But this says name and this says password here, your name and your password. Well, you remember, we already have a name and a password over here. So let's copy that name. And we'll paste that in. And the password's simple enough. Hit enter. And there we go. We are into the website. We have a list of names here. And as you can see, we don't see the phone numbers. 
All right, there's our first person from question one. When we pull up the search page, you can see the phone number is still not listed. So I'm guessing we don't have an admin privilege account. Let's take a look at some of the other pages, see if we can find anything interesting. All righty, settings page didn't turn up anything. Again, we're not an admin account, apparently. Messages does, and it seems we have a built-in chat here. Now, immediately, if you look up here, you see we have this question mark C equals five. So if you play around with this, it changes what's in here. So apparently, as each message gets added, it saves it as a new page. And this is how it loads it. So you can see that last comment that was there is no longer. So let's take some time to play with this, see if we can find anything interesting here. All right, I just jumped ahead and went ahead and put 10 up here to see how many messages we could get. And we get a, thanks, Guile. Can you share your credentials? We need privileged admin account for testing. So we've got a name now, Guile Bev. And of course, my password. It gives us password freely. So password, let's go ahead and copy that. And let's log out. And we'll try logging in as Guile Bev. Now, if you're not, I have notepad, mouse pad, something up. Remember, notes, notes, notes. Jot this down so you don't lose it. Alrighty, so we're logged in and we do have admin levels. As you can see, the phone number is here. And there's your answer for your first question. Of course, I have it blurred out here. So let's take a look around so we can find anything interesting. Alrighty, message page looks about the same. Didn't see anything new or different on there, but we actually have some setting options here. Customer settings, enter a customer name, enter a new password. So what happens if we just do A, B, save, password updated to B. Interesting. Let's fire up Burp Suite and take a look at what's going on. Alrighty, so as you see, I've got intercept on and I've got proxy proxy set to Burp here. So let's do A and B again and hit save. I'll just go ahead and let that forward come into history, send it to repeater, and now let's take a look at it. So it's doing a post to the settings page that we're on, and the host option we did while we were doing directory fuzzing, you see right there. So it just looks like it's passing the name and password we gave. It doesn't look like it's encoding it, but good to note, we do have a cookie here. So at this point, nothing stands out. This is where playing around is going to come into play. What happens if you change these values? What happens if you delete one of these and just pass, say, the name and not the password? Sometimes you're trying to look for a valid response back to give you information. Sometimes you're looking for an error code to give you information. So let's go ahead and delete that password off and send it. As you see, we get a reference error. Now this is settings.esj. That's gonna be your first clue. So for this, you wanna research EJS vulnerabilities. And eventually you'll stumble across this EJS server side template injection 3.1.9 issue number 720. This is out of the EJS GitHub. So going through this, kind of interesting, just follow along with it. And it does give a proof of concept of what this person used. And while going through this and reading, I stumbled across a CPE number here. So I had a starting point to do further research. Come to find out there were a few vulnerabilities that year for EJS and going through each of the CVEs that looked interesting that were server-side template injections, I stumbled across this write-up. This one was actually in 2022 and just happened to show up in a search I did because I eventually just typed in EJS server-side template injection RCE, which just happens to be the name of this write-up, and I went through it. And I do recommend you take some time to read it because it does a fairly decent documentation of how the process works and how he found. You come down to this, where he shows the code that they used. And the biggest thing is going to be after this. See the ID equals two, settings, view options, output function name. And then over here, we get an execution. So what can we do with this? Well, it's passing it as an addition to the parameters that this page is using. So if we grab this, copy it, go back into burp, add back in password, make sure we have all the things this morning, paste this in, and let's change the command here. All I'm going to do is tell it to curl or touch a web page that I'm going to host on my attack box. And to do that, we'll simply just use a Python module. Come back over here, hit send. As you can see, it worked. Okay, that's great. What can we do with it? Well, normally you would think of maybe trying to upload a file to see if you can get a reverse shell off that, like a reverse shell.php file. Or maybe you can see if you can just initiate a reverse shell with the command here. Let's try that one. Okay, we'll just keep it simple at first and go with an easy one, just getting netcat to do it. So before we send the payload, make sure you get your netcat listener started. So make sure you do bash dash c, double quote, because we're using the single quote to encapsulate it all. Then do your netcat command, double quote, single quote. Let's send it and see what happens. Okay, interesting, it did not work. So from this, go try a couple of different other shells see if anything happens. But remember, we're dealing with HTTP. Sometimes you got to encode things. 
So let's go give that a shot. We come back over here to our rev shell generator. We scroll down, you'll see it goes encoding options. Let's try the base64 here. Okay, so here we go. We're still doing our bash dash C. We're going to echo that string into the bash64 D so it gets decoded and then run that in bash. Let's see what happens. All right, still didn't get a reverse shell. Maybe let's go back and change our payload and see what we can find. So we're going to jump to the busy box. And let's go ahead and encode it. Now, if you've not used BusyBox before or are familiar with it, it tends to be the command that a lot of these machines have. So it's usually an easy go-to for getting a reverse shell. Okay, we're just simply going to replace that 64 hash there, run it, and there we go, we have shell. We're going to use Python to get a little bit better shell so we can see where we're at. And this is a perfect example why you should always remember to use Python 3, which I did forget right then. There we go, finally. Yeah, don't get frustrated because sometimes you can hit a typo, accidents happen. And now so we can have a clear function so the screen doesn't get cluttered up. We'll do export term equals x term, hit enter, and now our clear command works. So by looking here, we are logged in as the user web on the Cypress Bank server, and it looks like we're in a user directory, home directory, slash app. So let's see exactly where we're at. Sure enough, we are. We are in home web. So if we do an ls command, you see it looks like this is where the website is being hosted. Let's go back up and see if we can find anything else in the user directory. Sure enough, there you go, user.txt. Alrighty, so how do we going to get to root? More importantly, how are we going to get the root file? First thing I would always suggest to do, if you've not watched any of my other videos, is do the sudo-l command. Either one, you'll get some information back that can help you. Two, it'll ask for a password, which in this case we don't have, so no go there. Or three, it'll just come back and say, you're not allowed to run it, you don't have any options. Alrighty, and in this instance, we can use sudo without a password. And as you can see down here, we have this sudo edit command. This is where some more research will need to be done on the sudo edit, and you probably will eventually come across this. CVE 2023-22809. Basically, there are a couple of environmental variables, particular sudo editor, visual, and editor, that when set with this dash dash option, such as the example they provide here, and then sudo edit is ran, it will actually read the file here instead. And since we're able to execute this as sudo, that's how we're going to read the root file. So let me show you how that's done. So we're just going to do the export command again. We use editor equals by dash dash root dash root dot text. Fix it. And luckily on these box, the root flag file tends to always be the root text, so pretty easy to guess. And now we simply just copy, type in sudo, paste that command, and hit enter. And there you go. You've got the root flag. Oh, and by the way, to get out, it is colon, q, exclamation, enter, and you get out. Alrighty, and thus concludes White Rose. Like I said, pretty simple box. Does require you to do a little bit of legwork on the research for vulnerabilities. So that's really going to be the tough part on this one. Learning how to do searches for the software, the versions, find vulnerabilities you can execute is just as important to knowing what tools you need to run on your target. So if you made it to the end of the video, thank you for watching. Please remember to subscribe and like down below if you haven't already. And I'll see you next time.